Welcome to Brain Science, the show that explores how neuroscience is unraveling the mystery of how our brains make us human. I'm your host, Dr. Ginger Campbell, and this is episode 141. And my guest today is Dr. Rodrigo Kion Quiroga, author of The Forgetting Machine, Memory, Perception, and the Jennifer Aniston Neuron. Like many neuroscientists, Dr. Quiroga started his career as a physicist, but this allowed him to bring a unique set of computational skills to his study of memory. In this interview, we will talk about his research and the discovery of what might more accurately be called concept cells, rather than the better known term Jennifer Aniston neurons. I will be back after the interview to review the key ideas and to share a few brief announcements. As always, you will find complete show notes and episode transcripts on our website at brainsciencepodcast.com. You can send me feedback at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com, or if you prefer to leave audio feedback, you can do this via the SpeakPipe app or by going to speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis. Welcome to the show, Rodrigo. Thanks. So at the beginning of The Forgetting Machine, you mentioned that you began your career as a physicist. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you ended up in neuroscience? So, yeah, it's a long, it was a long way. So I started in physics, and when I was a student, I was fascinated by relativity, time travels. I mean, I guess I like science fiction a lot. I, I like these ideas of getting into a ship and traveling closer to the speed of light and then like going to the future or if it is possible to pass the speed of light and so on. And then I was very interested in cosmology. But as I kept on progressing in my career, I started to get less and less interested into that because I thought too far detached to reality for, for my liking. And I ended up doing a final year project related to EEG signal, electrographic recordings and chaos theory. And then I, I went to Germany, so I, I got my degree in physics, but then I went to Germany and did a PhD in applied mathematics. And I learned some methods, I mean, how to process data and so on. But I was always interested in, in how the brain works. And then I did a postdoc in another place in Germany, working on dynamical systems and statistical mechanics, but I was still interested in how the brain works. And at some point I had the opportunity to apply for a fellowship, which was in America and was targeted as hard scientists wanted to jump into neuroscience. And that's what I did. So I got this fellowship. I went to Caltech in California, and then I started really learning how, how the brain works. And the disadvantage is that I was a bit older than, I mean, the other people studying the brain, but I had a whole baggage of tools and stuff that I learned from my background in mathematics and physics. So I started using these things, and that's, that's how my career in neuroscience started. Great. The reason I asked you that is because a lot of my listeners are from a lot of backgrounds, and some of them are interested in getting into neuroscience, and they tend to think, well, it's too late. And I try to tell them that just about whatever field you're in, you've got tools. Yeah, well, I started in neuroscience when I was in my, I don't know, early 30s. Right. So at the end of the day, I mean, I'm nobody to give advice to anybody. But <laughs> for me, the, I mean, what I will tell my children is just do what you want. If you feel that you really want to do that, just jump. I mean, just, just do it. Otherwise, you are kind of stuck doing something that you really don't enjoy. And that's a pity. And by the time I moved to Caltech, that was the only thing that puzzled me. I really wanted to know how the brain works and was lucky enough to finally got into, into working in that. And where are you now? I'm in Leicester in England. Okay. And you've been there for quite a while? Yeah, more than 10 years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. So what's the main focus of your work? The main focus by far is memory. So I'm interested in how memory works. And when I say that, I really mean getting, as a physicist or as a mathematician, I really mean getting into the details. If somebody comes and tells me, well, you encode something and then you rehearse it and then you consolidate it, that, that's not enough for me. <laughs> I mean, I know that the brain has like millions or billions of neurons, and I want to know how these tiny little neurons make me remember, I don't know, the Fifth Symphony of Beethoven. I mean, how, how can it be? That seems like magical. 
And yeah, I record activity of neurons and I want to understand how different sets of neurons in different areas encode our memories. Great. And how do you use your computational skills for this? I got a lot of background in signal processing. And when you record signals from the brain, they are quite challenging. You really have to dig into the data to get the results. And the most famous discovery from our lab is these things that people call the Jennifer Aniston neurons. And these are neurons that nobody could see before because they didn't have the computational tools to see these neurons. So the neurons were always there in the recordings that people have been doing for years, but nobody was having the mathematical tools to really identify these neurons and see what they do. You say many of of your audience, there are people from different fields. There are tons of people from physics that they are into neuroscience. It's really surprising. I mean, you get to know some famous neuroscientists and after talking a while, you realize they come from hard sciences, that they weren't trained as neuroscientists. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's an advantage that people from hard sciences can, or that's a different focus that people from hard sciences can bring, that we have a sort of tools that we learn in our studies that we can apply to neuroscience. Right, I agree. So why did you decide to write this book, The Forgetting Machine? It's a long story, but I got more and more interested in trying not to be a classic scientists because nowadays I think the pity that we have as scientists or the crime we commit as scientists is that we focus way too much into our own field. So our view gets very deep but at the same time very narrow. I mean we are world well experts in our tiny little bit of, of science and I learned that there are people that have been thinking about exactly the same problems, but maybe not with the methods we have now. And this goes back to Aristotle, if you like. Aristotle was thinking about exactly the same problems. He didn't know that the thoughts are processing the brain. He thought the brain was a cooling machine and everything was processing the heart. He got it wrong in this sense. But the way he was thinking, the way he was thinking how we think, how we remember, it is very illuminating. And the idea for me is I tried to get out of my scientific publishing. I mean, when I publish a paper, I publish for my peers and I know that we know the literature and all the details. So I publish very detailed papers and I don't need to explain the broad context of what Aristotle saw and Descartes and Kant and other people. But when I write for the general public, I like to bring these two views together. No, I like to touch upon the big problem. That is the problem that people have been thinking for thousands of years, especially philosophers. And then I want to get into the details of what neuroscience has told us in the last years. So in part, the goal of the book is to bridge these two views. But to be completely honest, I have one very specific goal when writing the book. An editor asked me if I would like to write it. And I remember when, when I was a teenager, I wrote a book called What is Relativity? It was a very small book. And that decided me to study physics. Reading this book was the big thing that made it for me. Mm-hmm. And I thought, well, if I manage to convince one person, just one, of how fascinating neuroscience is, and maybe there's a high school student reading the book, and we say, wow, that's what I would like to do, and I will study that. Well, I think my purpose is fulfilled. That would be really rewarding. Did you at all want to overcome sort of the superficial information that's out there about the Jennifer Aniston neurons? That has been my karma for many years now. <laughs> so just to put it in a light way, speaking seriously, I mean, I published this paper. It was published in perhaps the best journal that is around called Nature. It got into the media, of course. I mean, the media will see, well, a paper in Nature with Jennifer Aniston on it is it's like a perfect combo. So it went into all major newspapers. It got a lot of publicity, but that really hurt me. I mean, I was very happy because I was thrilled. It was the first time that I was in the news and it was everywhere. New York Times, I mean, you name it. I mean, it was everywhere. But that gave me kind of a sloppy reputation among my colleagues. So it took me a while to publish the paper following this one because people won't take it seriously. And I would say, well, it's not my fault. The neuron did respond to, to Jennifer Aniston. What can I do? It didn't respond to Einstein. It did respond to her. So that's why it's, it's called the Jennifer Aniston neuron. So still like 10, 15 years later, I mean, whenever I give a talk, people laugh a lot about this Jennifer Aniston neuron. And, and I always start saying, look, don't laugh. I mean, it's funny. We can have all a laugh, but please don't be stuck with that and dismiss the serious part because these neurons are not just fun. I mean, they're telling us a lot of how the brain works. That's what I'm trying to convey. And that is really why I read this book, because I've been doing this show a long time and I don't do many books that are really aimed at general audiences anymore, because after 11 years, I'm more interested in the more complex books. But 
this is one of the things that attracted me to this book. And also, I've always been really put off by that, and I was really glad to see you explain the real science. And so we'll spend a few minutes on that in a little while, but we need to work toward it. So the focus of the book's memory, but you start out talking about perception and vision. Why is that? Because it's the same principle. So I think, I mean, I'm a physicist, and physicists, even if we don't want, I mean, we're still thrilled by simplifying things. Physicists, they are still looking for the single equation that explains the whole universe or a single force from which we can deduce all the different forces that we have in nature. And I love the idea that although perception and memory, they are different things, there's a very basic principle that rules both. And I think it rules also consciousness. I think it's, it's a very, very basic thing. And if I say it to you, it will sound obvious, but as obvious as it is, that helps me raise my case very naturally, because if you know just a little bit of neuroscience or about perception, you know that we see very, very little. What we see is more or less of the size of a little coin that we can hold with the arm stretched. So if we hold a coin in front of us with the arm fully stretched, that's more or less how much we see in focus. All the rest is diffuse. And we know that. We know that very, very well. It's very easy to test also. But now when I look around, I don't see like little patches of the size of a cone around me. I see a full thing. And then how can I see like that? Well, the idea is that it's a construction. What we see in front of us is a construction by the brain. It's not the eye the one seeing, the one that, that is creating the perception is the brain. And the same principle applies to memory. We have the feeling that we remember things as if we're passing a movie we have a flashback, no? And we go back to our younger ages and we pass the movie of our lives. And it's not like that. That's also a construction by the brain. We believe we have our continuous memories of events from our lives, but that's also an illusion, as it is an illusion, the idea of seeing. And then there's a second, you can build up on this idea because you can say, well, in perception, but how, how does this illusion of seeing everything in detail works? Well, the idea is that we make inferences, we assume things. So We don't need to see everything that is around us. We see just two, three little patches and the rest we infer it. And that's how perception works. And then you ask the same question, well, how does it work for memory? Well, it's exactly the same story. So you don't remember all what you have done last week, say last Monday. You just remember two or three salient events and then you construct a story around these salient events. So this is a construction. And then in perception, that's the final step, you have cases where these assumptions don't work, when these assumptions are wrong. So your brain will make assumptions and they are wrong. And these give rise to visual illusions. And that's very well studied. So we know that when the assumptions that the brain does don't work, then you have visual illusions. And the same with memory, because you make assumptions and you assume things were this way. And when these assumptions don't work, then you have false memories, which are also very well described. So I like this parallel because that gives me the case to explain how memory works, just making the parallel with vision. It's the same process. The idea is that the brain will process very, very little information, make inferences, and then extract a meaning and create a construction around the very little things we process. Great. And so I guess that means that when you're trying to figure out memory, you're not necessarily looking for a way that we could store every teeny tiny detail because that's not what the brain's really doing. Exactly. That's what I see with my data. We will talk about experiments later, but I give you just a little bit of information ahead of that. The main area that is involved in processing memories from our lifetime is called the hippocampus. And that's very well known. That has been studied since the 50s. We know that. Now, I have recordings in the hippocampus. I record from units in the hippocampus. I can explain you later why. But basically, I don't see details. These neurons are not encoding details. These neurons are encoding concepts. And that's the key for me. Is that, well, all these details of how the person looks like, what is this person wearing, what exactly this person said, and these things, these, these details are gone. The neurons are really not, they are not encoding this type of information. And it makes sense because when you try to remember things from your past and you try to analyze clearly how it works, the details are gone. You remember abstractions. So you remember the meaning of the things, but not the details. Right. Well, I'm getting old enough that I appreciate that that's definitely true. (laughs) (laughs) Me too, yeah. So we store very little of what we experience. Why do you think that's the case? Is it because the brain couldn't store all that or is there a better reason? The brain can store more. That's the argument I made in the book. I mean, I tried to put some simple back of the envelope calculations to show the brain can store much, much, much more than what it actually does. So the big difference is that the brain uses its resources not to store 
memories accurately, but to comprehend memories. So we don't want to remember, we want to understand, which is different. So in principle, we have zillions of neurons. With these zillions of neurons, you can store like 100,000 more memories than what we have or more. But we don't do that. And we don't do it because we don't need it. We don't care about that. I mean, we don't care about all these details. We care about the meaning. And is the meaning the thing that we use to think and to, to be creative? And this is another big message of the book. The other reason why I wrote the book is because I like to put forward theories that is hard to put in scientific papers because they are more speculative. Mm -hmm. And I like to speculate a bit. So an alternative title of the book could have been What Makes Us Human? And exactly what you ask is at the core of this question. So I'm speculating, and that's a speculation now, no? And that's, that's not a proven fact as what I told you before about these concept cells and so on. This, I think, will prove this point. But now the point I, I want to make is that that's the main difference between us and machines, artificial intelligence. Because if you have a computer, in the heart of a computer, you can store like thousands of videos, movies, pictures, and so on. But the computer doesn't understand what it has. So whereas, on the other hand, our brain, we have a huge capacity for storing, but we don't store much, we don't remember much, because we use these resources to understand the little information we do store. And I guess the sort of counter example that proves this principle is the savants that have these incredible memories. Yeah, but they are quite limited at thinking. So there are many cases of people with an extraordinary memory that they had serious trouble for thinking and especially for more conceptual abstract thinking. So I like the chapter in the book where you describe there's tools for memorizing, but that doesn't help our thinking. Yeah. It's the same discussion, no? Because if you start thinking, you're saying, well, it's the question you asked before. Why don't we remember more? We have the neurons. Why cannot we use these neurons to remember more? And then you realize, well, the reason is that, is that we don't want to remember. We want to understand. That's how our brain works. And then if you start thinking broadly, and that's what I told you at the very beginning, I mean, these are issues that other people have been thinking of. You can start thinking about the educational system. And I don't know how it was when you were a student, but I remember when I was a student, basically, I was mainly memorizing things. When I was a high school student in, in, in school, I was memorizing things, then had the exam, then repeat all the things I memorized, and then we go into the next subject. And then I memorize things again of a completely different topics, repeat it in an exam or write them in an exam, and then to the next subject and so on. And people don't know how the brain works because that's exactly what the brain doesn't do. So we are mm -hmm. forcing the brain to do something that is not built up for doing. I mean, the brain is built up for doing something much more interesting, which is processing this information. And that's why I criticize a little bit these mnemonic techniques for remembering more. There's nothing wrong with them. And there are tournaments about this and they are fun. I mean, and I have absolutely no problem with them. But the problem I have is when these methods are used to try to improve the performance of, of a kid at school, because this is going against what you really want, because you are getting this kid to remember more rather than thinking. And I think the educational system has to spend more time in, so first it has to think, well, it's impossible to remember these thousand topics in one year. It's way too much. All the students will forget that. So let's focus instead of in thousand, let's focus in 200, but let's make sure this gets very well settled and we can think about that and we can understand this information rather than bombarding students with information that it will be lost. Well, I agree with you. I was never a memorizer, and the only times in my life I've ever crammed. Yeah, you can do okay, but you forget it as soon as you're done taking the test. Yeah. In fact, by the time I got to med school, well, first of all, I struggled because I wasn't a memorizer, but I developed the habit of I'm not studying the day before the test because anything I put in my brain the day before is not going to have it the day after the test. What good is it going to be? Yeah. Of course, I wasn't at the top of my class, but I had the information I could actually use. I don't know if it happened to you. I remember when I was a kid, when I studied for an exam, when I did study for the exam, and then the teacher will come and I say, sorry, let's do the exam next week because <laughs> there was a problem. That was a horror because I said, oh my God, because I had all this knowledge, like very labile, and I knew that the day after will be gone. And that's the way I used to study. But it wasn't me. I mean, everybody was like that. All the kids that didn't study, they were happy because they won't fail. But all the ones that studied, they were like cursing because they were thinking, no, no, I cannot remember this one more week because it will be gone. So I have to study everything from scratch again. 
Of course, memory is not the only thing that the educational system ignores. I want to take a few moments to thank everyone who supports brain science financially via premium subscription, Patreon, or direct donations. Your support is essential because although this show started as a hobby, since my husband died in 2015, the income from brain science has become an important part of my budget. Without your support, I will not be able to devote the necessary time and energy to continuing to create new content. If you'd like to learn more about how you can help, please go to brainsciencepodcast.com forward slash donations. Let's talk a little bit about your ideas about how the brain represents concepts. That's more or less what I discovered. I see neurons that they represent concepts. So people talk about the Jennifer Aniston neuron. What is the Jennifer Aniston neuron? It's a neuron that will fire to any picture of Jennifer Aniston I showed. So it doesn't matter if it is Jennifer Aniston from front view, from profile, with particular haircut, with another haircut. It will just fire to Jennifer Aniston. And that's why people talk about the Jennifer Aniston neuron, because it was actually the first one I discovered. And as I discovered this one, I discovered another neuron that will fire to Halle Berry, and another neuron that will fire to the Sydney Opera House, and another neuron that will fire to the Tower of Pisa, and, and so on. Now, the important thing is that these neurons don't care about the details. And that's what I was telling you before. I mean, no matter which picture of the Tower of Pisa I showed, the neuron fire. And even if I read the name, so say the Sydney Opera House neuron. I mean, I showed the Sydney Opera House from different views and so on, and I wrote the word Sydney Opera, and the neuron fired. So this means that the neuron is firing to the concept and not to the particular pictures or stimuli that I use. And that was surprising at the time. I mean, everybody in neuroscience was shocked to, to see that there are neurons doing that. And these neurons are in a memory area. And then... This comes full circle, no? Because it's like, well, why do we have neurons firing to concepts and not to details in an area that is known to be critical for memory? Well, because that's the way we remember. I mean, and that's what we discussed before. We tend not to store or remember details. We remember concepts. Well, the thing that really struck me when I was reading the description, both in the paper and in your book, was, okay, so the Jennifer Aniston neuron, it turns out the next day you did more recordings, and it also responded to a picture of Lisa Kudrow. So yeah. we should have called it the Friends Neuron. No, because it wasn't Friends. Because it didn't No, no, fire. I mean, because that's the name of the TV show. I know, I know. But it didn't fire to the other three or four characters from the TV series. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. I also showed pictures of, let me see if I remember, it's Courtney Cox, I think was another actress in the TV series. Mm -hmm. And Matt, I don't remember his surname. And there was two or three more actors in the TV series. And it didn't fire to them. Okay. So there must have been some association in that person's brain between those two people. Exactly. Okay. So why do we have, and now we get into memory, like what was my puzzle when, when we started talking? So I said, I'm interested in memory, but I'm interested in really in the details of how memories are stored. Okay. Now, why do we have memories firing to Jennifer Aniston and Lisa Kudrow? Well, because the neurons are firing to associations. They are encoding not only concepts, but concepts and their associations. And if you think a little bit, that's kind of like the core of memories. So if I think of memories of my personal experiences, I remember yesterday I had, I had a beer with a friend of mine in a particular pub. And I will create a memory of that. And the core of this memory is the memory of my friend and the memory of this pub. And I make an association between these two. Or I remember, I don't know, I went to Paris and I met, I don't know, a famous actor just by chance. Then I will make a memory, an association between the memory I have from this actor and the memory I have from Paris. And I can build up things around this memory, but the core of the memory is to create associations between concepts. And that's what we found. I mean, and a big part of our experiments now is to show how these neurons encode these concepts and the associations between concepts. How did these experiments come about? Well, these experiments are done in patients that suffer from epilepsy that cannot be treated with medication. The clinicians, they will try different medications, but they don't work. And therefore, they're candidates to a procedure called epilepsy surgery. And the idea is to remove the area starting the epileptic seizures if this area is not critical for the functioning of the patient. 
and it's quite successful. So in many cases, they can remove a bit of the brain that starts the seizures and the patients become seizure free. So they get cured from epilepsy, which is something that is quite rare in, in neurology. You know, it's very hard to cure a patient, but in this case, it's very successful. Now, in most cases, if they are considering doing a surgery where they remove a bit of the brain, they have to be sure this bit of the brain they will remove is the one actually starting the seizures. And to be sure about that, they will introduce electrodes, tiny electrodes inside the brain of the patient, record seizures and pinpoint exactly where the seizures start from. And the fact that the patients have these electrodes implanted allow us to see what happens inside the brain of the subject. And the patients will stay in hospital for about one week to record enough seizures and make a prognosis of the case. So and that gives us time to do experiments, like very simple things, like showing pictures. We go with the laptop, we show pictures, and we see how the neurons respond to these picture presentations. And all our research, in this line at least, I mean, it's just building up from this idea. I mean, we record from these neurons, and we do these different memory tasks. We get the patient to do different memory tasks, and then we see what the neurons do. Okay. So you usually work over a period of about a week. Do people make, I think you said in your book that you also found neurons that reacted to people that were working with the patient in the lab? Yeah, like myself. I got neurons firing to myself. And this is very interesting because the patient didn't know me before. Right. So I see a neuron firing to myself and I know that I met the patient for the first time, maybe the day before I did the recording. So I know that this neuron was not there. I know that this neuron is relatively new. And that's quite interesting because the neuron even fired to my name if I will say the name or if I will write the name. And that's called a multimodal representation. So it's a neuron that fires to visual and to auditory stimuli. And this representation, which is multimodal, I know that it was created relatively quickly. It took no longer than one day because the patient didn't know me before. Well, so the fact that these neurons were multimodal a surprise? When I did the experiment to prove that they were multimodal, I was expecting them to be multimodal. I mean, it's a striking. If you talk to neuroscientists, or if, if I give a talk and I will show the responses of the neuron firing, for example, I'll give you a concrete example. Three pictures of Oprah Winfrey, very different pictures from each other. The name Oprah written on the screen and the name Oprah, say when the computer, the response is the same. And this kind of like unitization that everything triggers different sensory modalities, triggering the neuron more or less in the same way, is quite striking. But it makes sense because if I read the name of opera, or if somebody says the name of opera, or if I see her picture, it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. So all these different stimuli, they trigger the same concept in a memory area. Okay. Could you compare this, say, to what's happening in the visual cortex? How it's different? Yeah, it's very different because visual cortex, the function of visual cortex is seeing, recognizing things. And the challenges that visual cortex has, they're very different than the challenges that you have in the hippocampus, which is the key memory area. Now, I'm simplifying a lot when I say that, but basically in visual cortex, you want to have robust recognition. So if you see somebody from front view or from profile, or if the picture is occluded, you want to be able to recognize the person. And we can clearly do that. So the type of coding that you have, how neurons will do this function, is completely different than the type of coding we have in the memory areas I, I describe in the hippocampus. Because in the hippocampus, you don't want to do recognition. Recognition was already done in visual cortex. So from visual cortex, the signal goes to the hippocampus. And hippocampus wants to do something different. Hippocampus wants to have this concept representation and create associations between concepts. And hippocampus wants to do this fast. Why is that? Well, because that's the way our memory works. So if you see something that strikes you right now, I mean, you may remember it for years. And you won't see this thing striking you like hundreds of times before you start remembering it. Maybe you see something one time, I will remember it for many years. So hippocampus should be able to establish associations quickly because it might be just one instance of something happening and hippocampus should somehow encode this instance and keep track of this new memory. So that would be really different from what artificial intelligence does. <laughs> yeah. And you wrote in the book that you, when you're looking at your recordings, you can actually predict what the person's looking at if you're taking a recording from the hippocampus, but not if you're taking one from the visual cortex. We don't have recordings in visual cortex. So I guess that's not a good comparison. 
Yeah, but people have done it in monkeys. Okay. So you can also predict what the person is looking at, but the way you predict it is very different. So in visual cortex, what you have is you have neurons far into faces. Let's call it the face area. Now, what happens is if you show like 20 different faces, these type of neurons will tend to fire to all the faces or to big number of these faces, maybe to 10. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get one neuron, you cannot tell which face it is because the neuron fires to all the faces, right? to a big amount of these faces. So you don't know which neuron it is. But the trick is that the neuron fires in a slightly different way to different faces. Now, if you put many neurons together, now you can start seeing some pattern because you say, well, if this one fires very high, but this other one fires very low and this other one doesn't fire at all, well, then it's the first phase. Now, if this one fires low and the other middle and the other fires to top, well, then that's the second phase. And that's what we call the coding algorithm. So basically, if you put many neurons together, you can tell which phase it is. Now, in my case, when I go to the hippocampus, that was done in monkeys, not humans. Right. When I go to my recordings in humans in the hippocampus, it's completely different. I have one neuron, and I only need to see one neuron, and I can tell you for a fact, the patient right now is seeing Jennifer Aniston. And yeah, he was seeing Jennifer Aniston. He, was, he or she was seeing Jennifer Aniston. Or the patient right now is seeing Oprah Winfrey, because I see the Oprah neuron firing like, like crazy. So one neuron will tell me what's in the patient is seeing or even thinking. I can have the patient closing their eyes and say, well, think about one of these three or four people, and I can tell you which person the, the patient is thinking of, mm -hmm. if I have the neurons firing to these persons. So it's a pretty powerful method, but what about the limitations of this method? It's not a limitation because I don't want to read the mind of the patient. I mean, that's, that's not my goal. I want to understand how the brain works. So for me, it was very telling that I can tell what the subject is seeing with single neurons because this means a completely different code than the one happening in cortex, as we just described. Well, it makes sense because one is for perception and the other one is for memory. And then this thing of thinking about a concept and seeing if the neuron fires or not, it's also, I don't want to read the mind of the patient. I mean, that's his private mind. But for me, it's kind of like, it's a very important scientific information because it means that what in neuroscience we call it can be top down. So you don't need to show a picture to get the neuron to fire. It can be the internal thoughts of the patient that makes this neuron fire. Mm. Well, what I was really trying to get at is, since these experiments are done over about a week, you can't really, in this technique, say much about what's happening over long term in the person, right? I mean, that's a limitation. Yeah, it's a limitation. We can say things, but it's indirect. So that's, that's one of the main limitations we have. That's correct. For example, and we talk about the Jennifer Aniston neuron. I got a response to Jennifer Aniston the very first, already the very first time in the very first experiment, I showed a picture of Jennifer Aniston. So if the neuron fired to Jennifer Aniston the very first time I show her picture, this means that the neuron was already encoding Jennifer Aniston right. before I did my experiment. So this tells me that this is a long-term representation. So this neuron was already there doing that, encoding this person, Jennifer Aniston. So I cannot track the neuron for months to be able to see that the neuron was encoding Jennifer Aniston the whole time, but I know that the neuron was already doing that before I started my experiment. Mm -hmm. Does that change what we think about what the hippocampus is doing? Because I know that we always thought it was the place for consolidating new memories, but does this change our idea of the hippocampus role in memory? Yeah, it's what you say, but it's slightly different. So the what is called the standard consolidation model, which is the model that most people, or at least most people used to believe on, is that memories are first formed in the hippocampus, and then they are stored in cortex. So basically, the hippocampus will have a transient role in encoding memories, and then these memories will store for years to come in neocortex. Mm -hmm. That's a standard consolidation model. Now, there's another model that was proposed about 20 years ago with some first evidence, which has more and more support, which says it's true that the hippocampus first encodes the memories, and then these memories are stored in cortex, but only one type of memories do that. Other memories don't do that. The memories we are most used to are called declarative memories, which are things we can name. And these memories can be divided into episodic and semantic. Episodic memories are the memories of our experiences. I remember studying physics at the University of Buenos Aires, and I remember going to this class and this and that. This is my experience. This is, these are my episodic memories. Semantic memories are memories of facts, like Paris is the capital of France. Now, what the new theory says 
it's called multiple memory trace theory, is that semantic memories will indeed be stored in cortex, but episodic memories, the memories of our lifetime, will stay in the hippocampus. And why do people say that since 20 years? Because they analyze different patients with lesions in the hippocampus, and they realize these people don't have episodic memories at all. So all the memories from the lifetimes, they are gone. They can remember facts because it's a storing cortex, but all what is episodic of the lifetime experiences is all gone. They are completely amnestic about that. Now, my findings, I think they, they give some evidence to help making a decision between these two theories, because if the first theory I mentioned is true. You have a transient role of the hippocampus in memory, and then everything is stored in cortex. You shouldn't have any Jennifer Aniston neurons. Exactly. Why would I have a neuron encoding Jennifer Aniston? If this is a concept that is already well known, why this is not just in cortex, and these neurons should be there forming new memories of things that are unknown? So the fact that we see a Jennifer Aniston neuron that was encoding Jennifer Aniston before, as we see one for Oprah and Luke Skywalker and so on, means that the hippocampus has a role in long-term memory. It's not just temporary. So it's kind of like supporting more the second theory that I mentioned. Right. So it, would it be something like the concept is in the hippocampus, and when you start to think about, say, what you did yesterday, you trigger a few concepts, and then that leads to firing neurons in the sensory cortex so you remember what it felt like? Let's put an example. Let's say I went to Paris last week and I went to the Eiffel Tower and I met Oprah Winfrey, just by chance. Okay. So then if I'm watching TV at home and I see Oprah on TV, my Oprah neurons in the hippocampus will start firing because I'm seeing Oprah, right? And that, that's what we show in many experiments. So now what happens? What happens is that the hippocampus has a stored this association between Oprah and the Eiffel Tower, because last week I saw Oprah and the Eiffel Tower. And this will make the Eiffel Tower neurons fire, because the Oprah neurons are now linked to the Eiffel Tower neurons. Mm -hmm. And this is the way we have concept representations and we have associations. And then the associations, this mechanism of storing association by these concept cells can create kind of like the chain of thoughts. And that's, that's a very famous example of Marcel Proust in right. The Lost Time, you know, that one thing links to the other and this thing links to the other and so on. And I think these writings of Proust, this beautiful explanation of how a single hippocampus works. Basically, you jump from one concept to the next one that is associated, to the next one that is associated, and so on. So you create this change of thought. Now, in parallel to this, we have what you say. Because now, if I start from Oprah, and Oprah brings me to think about the Eiffel Tower, because I saw Oprah in the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Tower neurons in the hippocampus, they are not alone. It's not that the concept is only in the hippocampus. They are also a representation of this concept in cortex. So basically, when I light up the Eiffel Tower neurons in the hippocampus, these neurons will also communicate to neurons in cortex that also represent the Eiffel Tower in a different way, but they still represent the Eiffel Tower. And that will make me aware of the fact that the Eiffel Tower is a tall building that is a metal, that it has this particular shape and, and so on. But this, all this richness of memories, all these details of the memory, they're not in the hippocampus, they're storing cortex. Okay. And can we test this basic idea? Is there a way to test it since we can't record in the cortex yet? I mean, the whole loop that I told you, I think we cannot test because we cannot record single cells in cortex. Okay. Because the surgeons will not put electrodes there because typically they will put electrodes in the hippocampus. Okay. What I can do and what I did, what we did in my lab, is to show how these neurons encode association. So that basically allows us to go from one thing to the next. What are you working on now? Well, similar ideas, no, is keep on exploring, I mean, exactly how, how these neurons encode concepts, how they can create associations, how we store memories, and then... The most puzzling thing that I'm trying to investigate, because that's what it gets into the content of the book, you know, that's what it gets into philosophy, is trying to understand how much do we remember based on what the neurons tell us. Because if the neuron tells me, well, we don't encode this, we don't encode that, we don't encode that, well, then I would like to think and say, well, do we really remember this and that and that as we believe we do? <laughs> so I think the big question that goes outside the realm of neuroscience is trying to understand how much do we really remember and how do we remember. And I don't want to be a speculating. I mean, I want to do the experiments to see what the neurons do. And then based on what the neurons do, postulate what I believe happens in, in real life. Okay. 
And usually I ask people at the end of their interview for advice for students, but you actually did that at the very beginning. I don't know if you were aware. So is there anything I've left out that you'd like to talk about before we close? Maybe the thing we we touch more in passing, but it's the last chapter. So of this book, for me, if I have to describe the book in a way, I talk a lot about the book already, but basically all the first chapters are kind of like a preparation for the last chapter. I think that the meat of the book is the very last chapter, because that's where I put my big controversial, controversial or more like challenging ideas. Mm -hmm. But I didn't want to just tell the ideas just like that out of the blue. I want to give kind of like a whole context to explain why I say what I say in the last chapter. And the last chapter, I mentioned it very briefly, is basically what makes us human. And is going back to what we discussed at the beginning, is how this process of processing very little information and extracting meaning from this little information is completely different to what other animals do on the one hand and to what computers do on, on the other. And that's not coincidence. I mean, that's not by chance. I think that's the result of millions of years of evolution. And I tend to believe that this is the most important characteristic of our human thought. There are many, many discussions in philosophy, in science in general, about what's the difference between artificial intelligence and human intelligence, what's the difference between animal intelligence, like a chimpanzee and ourselves. I mean, why we are much further evolved in terms of intelligence compared to computers or to other animals. And I think maybe my bet, I mean, let's put it like this, my bet is that a key or the key will be this very fact. I mean, the fact that our brain is constructed to understand information, not to store it accurately. Right. And we can form a memory based on one instance. And that's what I keep thinking about when I read about deep learning and stuff. It's always about all these repetitive trials before it can do something and outsmart us, so to speak. But it still couldn't recognize somebody based on seeing them once. Yeah. Yeah. It needs a lot of training. Yeah. That wouldn't work in real life, in real people life. Yeah, but it, it's not just that. No, it's, Imagine that you get it. Imagine that you can create fast learning with artificial intelligence. I don't think that's an impossible challenge. Right. Maybe it has been done. Maybe I should be telling you, no, actually, this group, I mean, did that. Maybe somebody did it already. I, mean, I think it's quite likely that it was done. Actually, if you create networks like the one in the hippocampus, you can do it. There are people that did it. But the challenge is not just that. The challenge is extracting meaning. Why do I say that? Because extracting meanings is the basic of our creativity. So it's the basic of our, of our human thought. Because you can say, for example, I read a book and I don't care about the details of the book. I say, oh, this is a nice book about English mythology. And then I will say, well, I will extract the meaning English mythology. And then I will say, yeah, that reminds me of a book about Greek mythology I read when I was a student. And then I will I would like to compare the English mythology characters with the Greek mythology characters, and I will find this comparison amazing and maybe very creative. But to be able to do this comparison, I have to extract a meaning. I have to say, this book is about mythology. I don't want to remember the words of the book. I don't want to remember the details of each of the characters of mm-hmm. these mythological characters. I just want to get the meaning to compare with the meaning of something else. And I think that's maybe a key challenge for artificial intelligence. It's very hard to extract meaning. And I think that's what we are really good at as humans, no? Right. And meaning is different from every single person. Yeah. As you did say in your book that the memories or the concept neurons, what they do is subjective. Yeah. A meaning can be even different for the same person in different situations. So, I mean, maybe a dog, I would like to see it as a dog in one time, but if I'm seeing a competition of dogs, I would say, well, that's not just a dog, that's a Labrador. And look what the Labrador can do than a Chihuahua cannot. (laughs) But maybe if I see this dog passing by on the park, I wouldn't care if it's a Labrador or something else. I would just say, well, there's a dog passing by in the park. So the same stimulus has different meanings depending on, on the context, depending how I want to form a memory. That's a good point. Well, Rodrigo, I've really enjoyed our conversation. And this is the kind of interview I really enjoy because I really like my listeners to get a feel for what scientists are really about. And your passion for your work really comes through both in your book and and today in our conversation. Thanks a lot. I I also enjoyed it a lot. It was very nice. I want to thank Dr. Rodrigo Kion Kiroga for taking the time to talk with us. 
I think you will agree that his passion for neuroscience in general, and especially for studying memory, really came through in this interview. His book, The Forgetting Machine, Memory, Perception, and the Jennifer Aniston Neuron, is a valuable book for readers of all backgrounds. Even if you're already familiar with the basic concepts of memory, you will enjoy his account of how the concept neurons were discovered. If you are new to brain science, this is a great book to start with, and certainly a wonderful book to share with a young person in your life who is interested in science. From that standpoint, I would particularly encourage science teachers at the high school level to share this book with students. It will be a short, easy read for your best students, but within the capacity of most of the class. In reviewing the key ideas, I want to emphasize that much of what Dr. Kiroga talked about fits with the principles we have discussed with several recent guests. The first principle is that our brain constructs our experience. This is easiest to grasp when we study vision because it is straightforward to document the gap between our perception and the information that reaches the visual cortex from the retina. If you're interested in the numbers, you will enjoy what Dr. Kiroga calls his back-of-the-envelope calculations. The retina contains an estimated 126 million photoreceptors, but their information is funneled down to only 1 million retinal ganglion neurons, which are the ones that send signals to the visual cortex. Dr. Kiroga explains how this works in his book. He also reminded us that at any particular moment, we can only see a very small area clearly. But the key idea is, as he writes, the eye does not see, the brain does. Or to use the language of Lisa Barrett, one of our guests from last year, the brain constructs our perception of the world. Although vision is the most studied, the evidence is mounting that the same process applies to everything that we experience, including our memories. The average 35-year-old has around 10,000 memories. Dr. Kiroga explains how this number was calculated in the book, but the key idea is that this is much less than the brain's theoretical capacity. We spent quite a bit of time exploring why this is the case. The bottom line is that the brain uses its resources to determine meaning rather than to store irrelevant details. In fact, there are several famous clinical cases that demonstrate that people who remember everything have a seriously impaired ability to think. They might remember every single detail of a story, but they can't tell you what it means. Of course, a major focus of Dr. Kiroga's book is the discovery of the so-called Jennifer Aniston neuron. Of course, he also found other neurons that responded to other specific people, including himself and other people in his lab. Here are some of the important things to remember about these neurons. First, they're located in the hippocampus, which, of course, we know is very important to memory. They are multimodal. They responded to both seeing Jennifer Aniston and hearing her name, or any concept that would be hearing and vision, which would be multimodal. Next, they're plastic. They were able to learn new things, such as the people in the lab, and it was over a very short period of only about a week. Finally, the discovery of these so-called concept neurons changes the way we think memory works. It was formally assumed that the role of the hippocampus was a sort of temporary storage until the memory could be transferred to the cortex. Instead, it now appears that when one of these concept neurons is triggered, it then triggers the details in the cortex. Of course, this can't be tested directly since there is not yet a non-invasive way to record from single neurons in the visual cortex but it certainly fits the current evidence. If you think about it, it also fits our day-to-day experience. If you hear the word Jennifer Aniston, you are very likely to think about other characters on the show Friends, but only if you watch that show. Otherwise, you might think of other memories, or nothing if you don't know who she is. Another very important concept is that there is overwhelming evidence that our memories are dynamically recreated every time. This means our memory is not as reliable as we like to think, and it's also incredibly easy to create false memories. 
As Dr. Kiroga emphasized, we don't store memories like a videotape. We just store key associations that allow us to fill in the details as needed. It's very sobering to realize how incomplete and fragile our memories really are. But as he emphasized, a better knowledge of how memory works really could inspire changes in our educational system, starting with focusing on a few key concepts rather than the quantity of material covered. So I'd really like to hear your feedback about this episode. You can send me email at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com or audio feedback at speakpipe.com forward slash Doc Artemis, or use the SpeakPipe app on your mobile device. The show notes are located at brainsciencepodcasts.com and include episode transcripts along with links to the book on Amazon and Audible and other references. Don't forget, if you can't afford to support brain science financially, you can still help by sharing it with others and by posting a review in iTunes or wherever you listen. Last year, I started talking about taking a trip to Australia in 2018. And then I realized it would be better to do this trip with a group. So I've decided to move the trip forward to 2019 to allow time to recruit a small group of listeners to join me. When I say small, I mean 10 to 16 people. So if you're interested, you should write to me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com. I hope to actually have an itinerary within the next month or so, but since it's a small group, it will be first come, first serve. So if you want to come, please write to me as soon as possible. Next month's guest will be Dr. Michael Graziano, who was featured back in episode 108. We will be talking about his new book, The Spaces Between Us, A Story of Neuroscience, Evolution, and Human Nature. We will be exploring the importance of the neurons that monitor the space immediately around our bodies. Until then, don't forget to visit our website at brainsciencepodcast.com and sign up for the free newsletter so you can get show notes automatically every month. Thanks again for listening, and I look forward to talking with you again next month. Brain Science with Dr. Ginger Campbell is copyright 2018 to Virginia Campbell, MD. You can copy this show to share it with others, but for any other uses or derivatives, please contact me at brainsciencepodcast at gmail.com.